statements, you've just created an ally. Well, then what is so unbelievably difficult for people to understand that the same action, similar action, causes political enemies to exist? You create your enemies. In fact, you might even have your own men in there, you know, running the government in order to make these enemies. This is how this dialectic works. Now, in the field of, of pop music and rock and all of these things, you know, I don't approach it from a Christian point of view, so I'm not going to sort of you know, hammer these people just because they've seen wearing a pentagram one day or, you know, they dress in black or something nonsensical like a lot of the Christians, you know, who try their best to critique this stuff. Unfortunately, they get like way off, you know, in my opinion. And, and, and basically it comes into hammering their own theories, you know. You're going to have to be very impartial when you investigate occult matters. You know, Christianity is an occult uh, agenda which has been used by the mind controllers endlessly. You know, wasn't it Mark Hinckley or David Chapman was involved in some Christian network? You know, I know he looked after children. He spent a lot of his time working in uh, children's homes, in daycare and things like that. So these are virtuous Christian, soulful people who are not able to adjust to their society and then were picked up or experimented on or just asked to even do a simple questionnaire, just like the old Scientology gig. Well, we're doing a poll, we're doing a research, we're doing a survey. You know, we got the seven page, you know, uh, obligatory document we give out, you know, you don't know where that document is going. You don't know where that is going to end up or who's going to be studying it and going, hmm, interesting, hmm, interesting. Then they file them away and, and use them whenever they need it. This, this is exactly how it happens. You have to be very careful with all of this. Who knows where those that gigantic Scientology, you know, join up sort of questionnaire thing is really going. And what computer is reading it to find out exactly who you are and whether you fit one of their mind control, you know, skim out or not. And you, you know, by the time you find out, it's too late. But these individuals often, who um, are exceptionally gifted, can also be used. Sometimes consciously, sometimes unconsciously. And they are put before you. They're stereotypes, but they represent powerful archetypes. One of them being the Sun King, uh, the Solar King, like Elvis Presley. And in fact, it's absolutely uncanny in the last concerts that Elvis did, where he almost verbally is talking in terms of solar symbolism. If you can decode what he was saying on stage at some of the last um, concerts that he did, it's absolutely remarkable how much solar symbolism he's using, unbeknownst to himself, which is again how the archetype works through the stereotype. And one of the key things is that when the solar king is about to die or end his cycle, um, some of the mythologies, not all of them, but some traditions claim that the sun must die in water. In some kind of plunge bath or in some kind of uh, lake. And if you open some very early, you know, pictures of alchemy that are woodcuts, you can find these online, you will literally see that. You will see the king in his old age immersed in water. And where have we seen that before? You know, Jim Morrison perhaps, Brian Jones, you know, there's a whole, uh, uh, even the concept of dying by, on your own vomit or dying in alcohol, you see, in your lungs, is, is a water-based ritual type of thing going on here. So in the case of so many of these people, we need to look into some of the ritual elements of what was going on. Of course, the Mafia had their hooks into the music business going back to the jukebox wars. And then in World War II, the OSS started up a program called Operation Underworld, which entailed the actual recruitment of key Mafia figures uh, to operate in Italy and the United States. Right? And after World War II, they continued this, this uh, brotherhood between the CIA and, and, the, and the Mafia that continues to the present day. Now, under Operation Chaos, I mentioned that all intelligence agencies have been brought into the Umbrella program. Well, the Mafia was brought into it, too, because they were central to the music business itself, and they could be used to control and ultimately, in some cases, murder musicians who were outspoken in their opposition to the U.S. government. Jimi Hendrix was killed for two reasons. Uh, first of all, he had made statements in the teen press uh, calling for the Black Panthers to go to Washington, D.C. and shoot the place up. Secondly, he had done a, a benefit for Bobby Seale and the, and the Chicago 8. And that got the attention of the FBI and a program called COINTELPRO, which was a surveillance and assassination program. And it led to the murder of 28 Black Panthers. Tupac Shakur makes 29 because he was a Black Panther. Hendrix linked up with the Black Panthers, and for that reason, he was a dead man. 
but the Jim Jones thing has been blown wide open. If people know how to, you know, read, they can go to um, Colonel James Bogreitz's book, Call to Serve, which is a fantastic book. It actually deals very deeply with the truth about the Kennedy assassination. And uh, there's other books that detail the truth about the Jim Jones thing and show that it was a, it was a British crack unit. Not the SAS, but another, the Black Panthers or the Black something or other, oh, happened to just be on maneuvers, right, in Guyana, within a mile from where the assassinations and are meant to have taken place, the so-called suicide. If anybody believes that, I mean, they need their head examined, but, you know, it just turns out that when you really do the research, you find that some crack secret operational, you know, uh, crack squad of British troops, troopers are on location in Guyana at that time and it vanished as mysteriously as they came and the investigation never covered their presence. You know, and um, so, you know, all the way across the quasi understanding of religion and cultism, I think we were talking earlier about how you said the cult, cults were studied by the marketing men, the media, straight commercialistic people to see about allegiances so they could start, you know, um, infiltrating their own commercials for stupid cars and stuff like that with this cultish sense of uh, this imagery, you know, t to engender belonging in the sense of uh, belonging, the tri all that tribal stuff again. When I was a brand manager at Procter & Gamble, my job was basically to make sure the product was good, develop new advertising copy, design the pack. Now a brand manager has an entirely different kind of responsibility. In fact, they have more responsibility. Their job now is to create and maintain a whole meaning system for people through which they get identity and understanding of the world. Their job now is to be a um, community leader. It is the big monopolistic yeah. Yeah. Ad strategist Douglas Atkin, an expert on the relationship between consumers and brands, says he had a eureka moment one night during a focus group. I was in a research facility watching um, eight people rhapsodize about a sneaker. And I thought, where is this coming from? This is, at the end of the day, a piece of footwear. But the terms they were using were evangelical. So I thought, if these people are expressing cult-like devotion, then why not study cults? Why not study the original? Find out why people join cults and apply that knowledge to brands. I'm loyal to this practice because it's done so much for me. Right. If Atkin could find what pushed a person from mere fan to devoted disciple, perhaps he could market that knowledge. Most of the people I, I discuss the WWF with know that it's not a sport. Right. It's, a, it's a masculine ballet. So he compared dozens of groups he considered cults with so-called cult brands, from Harry Krishna to Harley Davidson. If you're smart and kind of individual, that's what you drive. Mm -hmm. From Falun Gong is it, is it to Mac. I think there's something about Mac users, like they get it. We just had discovered something. They realize there are other people like them and they cooperate on certain projects mm -hmm. and it's part of belonging to the tribe. And the conclusion was this, is that people, whether they're joining a cult or joining a brand, do so for exactly the same reasons. They need to belong and they want to make meaning. We need to figure out what the world is all about and we need the company of others. It's simply that. Saturn is a really good example. It's a mass cult brand. For example, 45,000 people turned up to spend their holiday their vacation time at the factory in Tennessee instead of going to Disney World or the Grand Canyon. Now why would they do that? It's because they wanted to meet other people who own Saturns. They wanted to meet the rest of the Saturn family. They wanted to meet the people who made the car. The people who made the car wanted to meet them. And the people who ran uh, the Saturn business knew that. This summer, They not only knew it, they turned it into an ad which only brought more people into the Saturn family. We called it the Saturn Homecoming. They could see where the idea for a new kind of car company had taken shape. And we could thank them for believing we could do it. And they created a great meaning system for Saturn. In those fantastic commercials, they, their meaning system was based on old-time values of community. It was a kind of an icon that America yearned for but couldn't find anymore. And that's the object of emotional branding, to fill the empty places where non-commercial institutions like schools and churches might have once done the job. Brands become more than just a mark of quality. They become an invitation to a longed-for lifestyle, a ready-made identity.
So as long as man has not got a center, as long as he's, you know, divorced from his own center, not aware about how his consciousness has been manipulated, he will remain open to this kind of manipulation. Fantastic uh, comment on this in Lord of the Rings. They didn't bring it out in the movie, except in one very short line, which is hard to miss, but in the book they emphasize it very, very prominently, that when they're approaching the wizard Saruman, who's a character in the story who's uh, basically was a good man turned evil, 